questions. What is one takeaway you hope graduate students and postdocs take away from this conversation? Number one is it, the job search, um, I tell the doctoral students at, at Baylor this all the time, uh, the truth about the job search is that it sucks until it doesn't. Um, it is awful and it's agonizing and it's grueling and it's filled with anxiety because unlike finishing your dissertation, um, the dissertation, um, at some point in the dissertation, the light at the end of the tunnel appears and it very, very slowly grows and you're, you've got this kind of goal that you're heading for. Um, the job search is more often like going around a curve in a tunnel. You can't see the light until you're almost in it. And so um, I've worked with those kinds of doctoral students who I've written 20 or 25 letters for um, to try to get, you know, reference letters to try to get a position. And it's, I mean, it's just an agonizing position. And so just don't give up. And if you can, even though you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, one day you'll be standing in the sunshine and it will be wonderful. Number two is do not wing it. Um, even when you get on the job, when you land the interview, don't win the interview. Um, I, there's a story of a, a, a student who worked with me. She applied to 40 positions and got four interviews. And that sounds like a 10% uh, success rate. But she had four on-campus interviews and she got four job offers. That sounds like a 100% success rate. And the reason that she did is she put a packet together. I said, would you sure just send me the material you prepared, because I had heard from a friend that she did this, and she had about 25 pages worth of prepared material for every institution she went to. She knew the name and almost a CV of every person she was going to talk to, and she could say, tell them about themselves. I mean, she was exceptionally well prepared. And then um, number th the third thing is to ask for advice when you get stuck. Many of us will have the experience of being really good at getting to a certain level in the application process. I'm really good at getting the phone interview, and I can't get past the phone interview. Well, then go ask for advice from somebody. What must I be doing? And talk to them about that stage. Or, you know, I've written 50 applications, and I'm not getting any interviews at all. Okay, there's, there may be something wrong with your written material, and, you know, so you've got to hire somebody to look at your material and see if they can uh, get it fixed. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, the takeaway for you all, there's more than one way to be a scholar. A lot of times we get concerned about reputation or like, am I supposed to do this or am I supposed to do that? You have to figure out, like I said, the, the trinity to scholarship is teaching, research, and service. What makes you feel significant? What balance do you want? Are you really heavy on the teaching side and you just love that? And do you like working with a diverse group of students, like people who are 18 all the way to the age of 80, you know, and you like that? Then you might like community college. But don't feel like there's only one right way to be a scholar, or like one is better than the other, like objectively. It's more just what makes you shine. And just know the difference between happiness versus satisfaction, and success versus significance. And decide what's important to you, and how those can work together, but also how those can work against each other. And also think of yourself as a scholar, but don't also forget to think of yourself as a human being. One of the things that I've noticed has been a trend over the last few years at OSU is that we hire people that we already knew. They're not OSU grads. We don't really like to hire our own grads. A lot of institutions don't. But we knew them. Um, the discipline knew them through conferences, through research re relationships. Sometimes one faculty knows another faculty at the institution, and that doc student, they're, they're talking. So higher ed is, I cons it's a small family. It really is a, well, it's probably a big family, but it's, we know each other. So, and we're friends with each other, and we talk to each other. We see each other at conferences. We read each other's work. We email each other and say, hey, I read your work. And so it's a small, small world. So I think knowing that, um, as you're out there interacting, getting, getting to your conferences, getting to know people, that's going to help you as you do your job search. But remember, we're all kind of family. So if you're applying to an institution, certainly in the Big 12, my guess is we probably, they probably know your advisor. They know your program. They, know, they might know about you. And use that to your advantage. Um, if you're going outside the Big 12, we still probably know you because we're reading in our field. So remember that, and as I kind of tell people, re make sure that the stories we're hearing about you are really good ones um, because 
sometimes those letters and things are all great, but honestly, I've already talked to your advisor. I've known about you for a while, and I want you. That happens a lot in our fields, particularly in fields where we're looking to fill a particular area of expertise or a, a research um, agenda. So just remember you're part of a really big family. Use that to your advantage, um, and I think you'll, you'll do very well. All right. I will, something I would like to add as a person that's on the market, I think oftentimes this process is lonely. Um, I would say get a community or board of directors, people that you know you can go and talk to about the process of the job, but also someone you can go to and just sit in the office or on the couch and cry for a little bit. <laughs> I celebrate those moments. So have people that are around you for different reasons to help sustain you through this process. Uh, relationships are still important as they will follow you throughout your career.